All righty. So um, I am really excited to have you all here. And um, I am Jackie Tileston, Associate Professor in Fine Arts. And I would like to thank you for coming to this evening's dialogue. Um, other ways of knowing the superhumanities and the future of knowledge with Jeffrey Kripal. This event is co-sponsored by the Department of Fine Arts and the SNF Paidea Foundation. The Stavros Niarchos Foundation Paidea program serves as a hub for civic dialogue in undergraduate education at Penn. SNF Paidea collaborates with many campus entities to promote opportunities for students to develop the knowledge, skills, ethical frameworks, and experiences necessary to be informed, engaged, and effective community members and leaders in society. The SNF PIDEA program encourages the free exchange of ideas, civil and robust discussion of divergent views, and student and community wellness through SNF PIDEA designated courses, a fellows program, and campus events. Tonight's event is an extension of my seminar this semester called Mystics and Visionaries, Art and Other Ways of Knowing. In this seminar, we are using art as a lens to look at how various states of consciousness can contribute to knowledge, creativity, and our perceptions of reality. We are exploring different ways in which artists have accessed nonlinear and alternative modes of seeing, cognizing, and embodying noetic territory via a multidisciplinary approach. Last semester, I shared an interview with Dr. Jeffrey Kripal on his book, The Flip, with my students, and they flipped. It so completely galvanized and excited them that I knew I wanted him as a guest this semester and that we needed to share him with the wider community, not just the seminar. So it was in a late night reading of the flip that I first encountered, for example, the idea of cosmopsychism, um, a trigger that sent me down a thrilling rabbit hole that kept me up way past my bedtime. And needless to say, Kripal's work is full of such voyages and it will keep many of you way up past your bedtimes if it hasn't happened already. So Jeff Kripal is the Associate Dean of the School of Humanities and holds the J. Newton Razor Chair in Philosophy and Religious Thought at Rice University, where he also chairs the Department of Religion for eight years and helped create the GEM program, a doctoral concentration in the study of Gnosticism, Esotericism, and Mysticism that is the largest program of its kind in the world. He specializes in the study of religious states, putting the impossible back on the academic table again. His book, The Flip, chronicles a shift from a materialist worldview to one in which mind is fundamental and cosmic. Kripal is the author of many fascinating titles, including Kali's Child, The Serpent's Gift, Mutants and Mystics, and Secret Body. He is currently working on a three volume study of paranormal currents in the history of religions and sciences for the University of Chicago Press, collectively entitled The Superstory. I see a lot more rabbit holes in our future here too. Kripal's work is a free range adventure spanning Greek philosophy to the occult, noetic currents, immediate gnosis, mysticism and the countercultural, and how these subjects that are routinely brushed off the academic table may very well change the future of how we think and learn and engage with the world. Kripal is not just a transhumanist, but a superhumanist. And I am super excited to have him here with us tonight. Um, so I will turn it over to Jeff who will talk for a while and then we'll have a short dialogue and then I will open it up for Q&A afterwards. So um, I will now pin Jeff okay. and unpin me. Okay. So now, now I should talk. All right. Um, thank you, Jackie. That was that was better than I am. So, but it was it was it's still nice. Always nice to hear exaggerated comments about oneself. Um, I think what I would like to do today, I'm going to talk for 30 minutes. Jackie and I talked yesterday. We we agreed I would talk for 30 minutes. 
And then the two of us might have a, an exchange and then we can open it up to a, a broad ranging conversation. I certainly want to have that conversation. I do not want to blab for the whole hour and a half. Um, but I also want to give you something. Uh, I, I do have a formal 30 minute lecture here that, that I'll be reading from and talking from, and I'll give you some intellectual substance. It starts off very philosophical, very abstract, and then it gets into a number of examples and then ends abruptly. Um, but I think that'll, that'll give us an opportunity to talk. Um, so here, we, here it goes. Um, first, allow me to begin with a few general observations about the Academy's present order of knowledge, a phrase I borrow from Michel Foucault. Very, very generally speaking, that order of knowledge is organized along a hierarchy of values within a specific materialist metaphysics. We might think of the sciences as disciplined forms of knowledge concerned with the behavior of matter or objective reality with the number or mathematics as the privileged symbolic medium. We might think of the humanities as disciplined forms of knowledge concerned with the expressions of mental reality or forms of consciousness coded in culture with the text or narrative as the privileged symbolic medium. So object and subject, number and narrative, mechanism and meaning. This order of knowledge is also an order of values or ontological judgments. The objective material aspects are considered real, whereas the subjective mental aspects of reality are considered less real or even unreal. The outside of reality is manipul manipulable, measurable, and predictable, and we can engineer technology out of it. The inside of reality not so much. Some go so far as to mock and demean the inside of reality with their constant refrain that every human experience is nothing but an anecdote and that many such anecdotes do not add up to evidence. What they really mean is that they have no idea how to study or understand these inner worlds. A hierarchy or pecking order of knowledge follows with the study of matter, like physics and chemistry on top and the study of mental expressions like philosophy, history, art, and religion on the bottom. Biology is messier. It has to contend with that annoying category of life, which it generally refuses to grant any ontological status. Biology must also deal with DNA, whose winding replicating structures act as much like an esoteric or invisible text as they do a living super machine. Geneticists even speak of letters and of reading such a secret code. The social sciences, psychology, and sociology are def definitively hovering somewhere in the middle of this hierarchy, wanting to be hard sciences, but forever having to study soft human beings. Why begin with such abstractions? Because they help us to think. Once we understand our present order of knowledge in this way, it becomes obvious why some altered states of mind and body have such a difficult time fitting into that order. The reason, they do not follow the script. They are neither purely objective nor purely subjective. They're both. Worse yet or better yet, some of their most extreme instances involve the bending back of space and time and the apparent transcendence of bodies and brains. Think precognition, telepathy, clairvoyance, and out-of-body experiences. And so they almost completely collapse this useful distinction between the external and the internal worlds. Such moments, which please note often affect history, possess immense historical agency, as we like to say, are as offensive to many of our humanist colleagues as they are to our scientific ones. How dare you assume that social reality is not ultimate? How dare you suggest that human beings might have some power over physics, causality, space, and time? Such phenomena are outrageous. They cannot be, so they are not. And yet these things happen 
all the time to all sorts of people all around the world and as far as we can see back with our recorded, if always fallible histories. I can show you telepathic mind reading and the rattling chains of an angry ghost at midnight, no less, in seventh century China or in a modern Gothic novel or horror film. The context matters, but barely. We are like the tourists visiting the Grand Canyon who obsesses about the local history and meanings of the graffiti on the handrail, but will not look up. Clearly something is off. What is off I wanna suggest is not the behavior of reality around the globe, but our present order of knowledge that claims to understand or encompass that reality, but which actually cuts it up into tiny analytical pieces that do not in fact exist in nature. That knowledge is glaringly incomplete and inadequate. It is not that it is wrong, it is more that it is half right. We are staring at the handrail, not looking at the Grand Canyon. And yet, it has not always been so. We have not always been so and My present coinage of the superhumanities is another attempt to encourage and develop this uncanny collapse of the external and the internal, of the material and the mental, to make the impossible possible again. The expression signals nothing new. To put things too simply but accurately, by the superhumanities, I mean something that already exists. I mean to point to a fantastic but forgotten dimension of the humanities and the arts, which consists of the catalytic presence of altered states of mind and energy that have driven the creative processes of some of our most revered authors, artists, and activists. The superhumanities then are nothing more and nothing less than the humanities themselves, now acknowledged and celebrated as astonishing. The superhumanities are the Superman to the Clark Kent of the humanities, the weird crashed alien to the dull bes bespeckled human in the office. Same guy, different costume. Don't be fooled by the glasses. There is a less mythical way to say the same. I do not believe that some of the most impactful ideas of the humanities emerged from thinking. I believe rather that they emerged from altered states of knowledge and energy, that they were experienced as given. They crash landed. We do not think, we are thought. A corollary, a corollary follows. To the extent that we reduce or restrict the humanities to these strictly conscious and intentional cognitive modes to thinking, we will make them culturally irrelevant, intellectually boring, and spiritually insignificant. We will destroy them. Okay, so this next section is called simply name dropping. I'm gonna go through a whole series of names. It'll start out very male and very, very white, but I promise you it will not end that way. It'll, 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 get, it'll get more contemporary pretty quickly. First of all, Immanuel Kant. Early in his career, Kant published anonymously, by the way, some thoughts on the Swedish scientist, engineer, seer, and spy, Emanuel Swedenborg, who would inspire so much of the later spiritualism of the following century. Andrew Kant's book, Dreams of a Spirit Seer, Elucidated Through Dreams of Metaphysics, which came out in 1766. The book is generally taken to mean what its Latin epigraph from Horace seems to say, which reads thus, like the dreams of a sick man, impossible pictures are wrought, unquote. Except that the book does not actually mean that. Indeed, when one actually reads the book, it is difficult to avoid the conclusion that Kant's initial use of Horace and dozens of other snarky phrases liberally scattered throughout the pages are more rhetorical than honest. But as one reads on, such snide dismissals begin to look more and more like ways that a gifted writer sought to distract his readers from his own deeper hunches, which were much more complex and confessing and far more open 
to the phenomena that he seemed to be ridiculing on the page. The actual doubled or superhuman situation becomes even more striking if we read Dreams, the book now, alongside Kant's private correspondence. Kant, it turns out, investigated the seemingly miraculous gift of Swedenborg and found it to be much more convincing than he gave evidence in his now famous- Jeff, you're frozen for a minute. Like that. Okay. Kant investigated the seemingly miraculous gift of Swedenborg and found it to be much more convincing than he gave evidence in his now famous public takedown. The case that for him had what he called the greatest evidential force of all and really deprives all conceivable doubt of excuse, those are his, those are his words, took place at the end of September in 1756 at the home of Mr. William Castle in Gothenburg during a social function or party of some pep public repute. So this was a, a party of high nobles in, in Gothenburg. Here is Kant telling the impossible story to a correspondent. So I'm just quoting from this letter now. That evening around six o'clock, Herr von Swedenborg left and then returned to the drawing room, pale and agitated. He said there was even now a dangerous conflagration, a fire in Stockholm in the Sudermalm, which was a Southern suburb of Stockholm that lies some 50 miles from where he was at the time in Gothenburg and that the fire was rapidly spreading. So Swedenborg was watching this fire spread through this neighborhood 50 miles away in his mind. Swedenborg was restless and went out frequently. He said that the house of one of his friends whom he named already lay in ashes and his own house was in danger. At eight o'clock after he had gone out again, he joyfully exclaimed, praise be to God, the conflagration has been extinguished three doors from my house. Okay. So that's Kant's letter. Kant then explains in the same letter that the vision created a public sensation and that a government investigation ensued immediately. I quote, on Tuesday morning, a royal courier arrived at the governor's with news of the fire, the damage it's caused, and the houses that it affected. This report did not differ in the least from the one Swedenborg had given at the same time, unquote. The, <clears throat> Um, okay, so that's Kant. He, he, he's, he's received in the humanities as making fun of Swedenborg, but in actual fact, he thought he was the real deal. Now take someone like Arthur Schopenhauer, another famous German intellectual. Schopenhauer, of course, is usually remembered as a pessimistic philosopher of a dark cosmic will. The, the, the truth has to be depressing if you work in the humanities. That's the basic rule. What we are seldom, seldom told is that Schopenhauer was fascinated by what we would today call paranormal phenomena and saw these as intimately related to his idealist philosophy, which was cosmic and evolutionary in nature. Of course, Darwin hadn't happened yet, but Schopenhauer was clearly working with a kind of proto-evolutionary vision of course, Schopenhauer did not use the word paranormal either. It had not yet been invented. In his earlier magnum opus, The World as Will and Representation, Schopenhauer used contemporary German phrases like magnetic clairvoyance or animal magnetism. In a late and long appreciative, really odd essay, he used expressions like spirit seeing, second sight, and a second self. Astonishingly, he also fully acknowledged that such capacities are, are identical to what earlier generations had called magic. He also linked this clairvoyance to the natural world and the evolutionary processes that produced in order the plants, the animal kingdom, and finally the human species. He even described his own precognitive dreaming of a banal, entirely accidental event, an ink spill involving a household maid that played out in perfect detail the next day. He flatly described this precognitive dream as Vauer Traumann, dreaming the real. I must add that these magnetic or paranormal fascinations were not side interests of the philosopher, some temporary weakness or late eccentricity. This was no youthful mistake. 
This was a mature conclusion. For Schopenhauer, clairvoyance and magnetic phenomena give solid witness to the truth of idealism. And his idealist philosophy best explains the data of clairvoyance and second sight or precognition. They implied or supported one another. Take the precognized or dreamed ink spill. Such a dreaming, he argued, can penetrate into the actual future, which already exists since temporality itself exists only on the level of representations. In essence, the brain constructs the illusion of time, not on the level of the cosmic will, which exists entirely outside of space, time, and causality. This is why Schopenhauer believed that these magnetic or magical phenomena should lie at the heart of the philosophical project. He was convinced that such what he called extremely marvelous and positively incredible phenomena were, quote, incomparably the most important of all the facts that are presented to us by the whole of experience, unquote. As a result, he felt utter exasperation at those who refused to take these accounts seriously. He wrote, whosoever at the present time doubts the facts of animal magnetism and its clairvoyance should be called not a skeptic, but an ignoramus, unquote. Then there was the inimitable Friedrich Nietzsche, died 1900. Enter the enigmatic future human or Ubermensch, traditionally from 1905 on, the Superman in American English, but more recently and accurately rendered as the superhuman. Such a collective being or evolving superspecies was seen and prophesied by the ecstatic German philosopher in his final years, but particularly in his Thus Spoke Zarathustra, which came out in 1884. The book would be ignored in the author's time and by his own assessment, profoundly misheard, or rather not heard at all. Still, it would eventually become one of the best-selling and most read philosophical works of all time. This publishing tidbit is no tangential factoid. It is an uncanny sign of our own modern world, and particularly of that branch of higher education known, but not really known, as the humanities, where the text is commonly read and widely revered, and just as commonly dismissed or condemned to this day. Nietzsche certainly knew he would not be understood. And one of the more humorous but instructive images of his unpublished notebooks, Nietzsche would write that he is strolling around above our heads on the next floor up. We cannot stand this, so we put, quote, wood and earth and refuse, unquote, between him and us, so as to muffle the speech of his steps. As for the roof over his head, it begins in what he called that place where all stairways end, unquote, entirely beyond thought and experience itself, the open sky. I am presently reading as much of the Nietzschean corpus as I can, including the translated Naklas or notebooks. I have not found what I assumed I would find. I have not found an angry atheist or a naysaying nihilist, much less a postmodern deconstructionist. I have found a godless mystical writer with an esoteric evolutionary vision who described himself as the most spiritual of human beings and who openly described his deconstructive no-saying books as mere fish hooks, angelhaken, means to catch the reader for the vastly more important yes-saying book of Thus Spoke Zarathustra and its twin teachings of eternal recurrence and the Superman. Indeed, when all is said and done, Nietzsche wished to be only a yes-sayer. The genealogies and deconstructions, it turns out, were just warm up. What I found in reading Nietzsche, in other words, was that academics generally ignore, really reverse Nietzsche's own authorial intentions and ecstatic voice and focus instead on our own depressing and nearsighted nihilisms and deconstructions. We refuse to look too far. We turn away from the seer superhumanism and turn back to our own humanism. We stare at the rotting guardrail and refuse to look up at the Grand Canyon. In Nietzschean terms, we choose to remain Kleine, puny. Nietzsche, by the way, was also a precog 
and recorded numerous anomalous experiences. In 1851, for example, as a 13-year-old boy, Nietzsche dreamed of his recently deceased father emerging from a grave, going into a church, and returning into the grave mound with a child in his arms. I quote Nietzsche, on the day that followed this night, little Joseph, his younger brother, suddenly fell ill, seized by severe cramps, and after a few hours died. Our grief knew no bounds. My dream had been fulfilled completely, unquote. I understand perfectly well that these first three figures are dead white German men, and that it is now the academic thing to do to reject them because of this, or at least point out their bad politics that indeed can seldom be aligned with present democratic and liberal values. The superhuman does not go away because of this though. It burns just as brightly in other cultural contexts, including in the contemporary English and French worlds. And Jackie, I'm gonna skip this part. I, I go through uh, William James, but I'll skip the Jamesian stuff because it's, it's often, it's well known. James used what we now call psychedelics um, to, to, to induce uh, mystical states and, and, and write out of them essentially. What may not be known is that James had a very gifted undergraduate student by the name of W.E.B. Du Bois. Uh, du Bois has suffered a similar partial reading. Du Bois would have a most remarkable life which included studying in Germany with some of the most influential social scientists of the time a Harvard PhD in sociology. He was the first African-American to be awarded a PhD at Harvard and becoming the author of a book that is read and taught to this day in the humanities, The Souls of Black Folk, which came out in 1903. Indeed, Du Bois is justly famous for being one of the undisputed founding figures of what today we call critical race studies and was the first to locate historically and theorize the category of whiteness. True to the superhumanities and the opening lines of his most famous book, Du Bois distinguished his own voice as both that of the scientific sociologist and that of the traditional seer. So I'm gonna read a few passages here. Du Bois, du Bois writes, after the Egyptian and the Indian, the Greek and Roman, the Teuton and Mongolian, the Negro is a sort of seventh son born with a veil and gifted with second sight in this American world, a world which yields him no true self-consciousness, but only lets him see himself through the revelation of the other world. It is a peculiar sensation, this double consciousness, the sense of always looking at oneself through the eyes of others, of measuring one's soul by the tape of a world that looks on and amused to contempt and pity. One ever feels his two-ness, an American, a Negro, two souls, two thoughts, two unreconciled strivings, two warring ideals in one dark body whose dogged strength alone keeps it from being torn asunder. The historical origins of the key Du Boisian expression, double consciousness, lie in the history of European esotericism, and more specifically in mesmerism, magnetic sleep, and spiritualism. But the other phrases here are all similarly sourced and overdetermined. Seventh son, born with a veil, second sight, tunis. These are all classically spiritualist or occult tropes, which would have been immediately recognized as such in his own day. Born with a veil, for example, refers to the folklore around infants being born with the amniotic sac wrapped around their head or entire body thereby signaling, as the folklore claims, the future manifestation of various occult superpowers, spirit seers, essentially. It is hardly an accident then that Du Bois named his most famous book after souls, not social identities or historical constructions, or that he would also imagine a democratic or cosmopolitan utopia beyond race as a fourth dimension another clear and obvious spiritualist and later paranormal trope. We know that Du Bois learned of the fourth dimension from James in 1888, to be exact. He was reading with James books like Charles Howard Hinton's Scientific Romances, which included the essay, What is the Fourth Dimension? Hinton's book was an early precursor of American science fiction and was a contemporary of Edwin A. Abbott's Flatland. <clears throat> 
the invocation of occult tropes and themes from double consciousness to the fourth dimension, in other words, was being used to theorize race and class in American society. I'm going to skip the, the section on Derrida and Foucault, but Derrida wrote a late essay on telepathy and revealed his own experiences of telepathy, took it, took it as obviously real. Um, Foucault uh, had an LSD acid trip in the desert um, that influenced the writing of a history of sexuality series. Um, I see the time. I'm going to just spin through this. Uh, there is a section on the American Chicana queer and post-colonial theorist Gloria Anzaldúa, uh, who was born just south of here on the Mexican-Texan uh, uh, border. For those of you who do have not read Anzaldúa, she writes about, um, her most famous book is called Borderlands. She, she writes about mixings, essentially. There are numerous Anzaldúan themes that are obviously superhuman. She even uses the word superhuman, including the evolutionary capacity, what she called la facultad, and a subsequent understanding of comparison as a kind of traumatic and revelatory mixing. She is in fact explicit about the superhuman which she relates to the sexual. I quote, humans fear the supernatural, both the undivine, the animal impulses such as sexuality, the unconscious, the unknown, the alien, and the divine, the superhuman, the God in us. Culture and religion seek to protect us from these two forces. She also relates a number of her own paranormal experiences body experiences that we now recognize as clairvoyant. Um, my last figure is Amitabh Ghosh. I'm not going to talk about him either because we're out of time here, but, but Ghosh's um, novels um, are filled with occult and paranormal tropes and themes. He sees non-human agents as really key to thinking about environmental issues. Uh, he talks a lot about the dead, about spirits, about souls. Um, about para, parapsychology, about anthropology. These are all aspects of his writing that I think are really important to, to, to know about. So again, he's another kind of superhumanist in, 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 in this language. My final paragraph, and then I'll shut up, um, Jackie. Um, Kant's secret sympathy for Swedenborg, just to sum up, Schopenhauer's dreaming the future, Nietzsche's evolving superhumans, James's psychedelic self-experiments and psychical research, Du Bois's souls and double consciousness, Derrida's telepathy, Foucault's truth, capital T, and California counterculture, Anzal Dua's evolutionary La Facultad, and Gauche's precognitive ecology are just a few moments in the history of what we now call the humanities. We could go on and on here all day or all week or all month. That's my point. The simple truth is that there are no humanities without the superhumanities. They have always been us, just as Clark Kent is really always and everywhere Superman. It is time to take off the glasses. Great, thank you. Thank you, Jackie. Maybe where, where I'd like to um, begin is a place that I find super exciting is the notion of how scholars like you are kind of pushing the boundaries from within the system. And I'm wondering like, like with the flip, with these paradigm shifts that kind of happen inadvertently to these scientists, like what, what would need to happen for that paradigm shift to happen um, within the humanities, within university systems, and just within intellectual culture, really, um, so that so that these kinds of topics are not considered like intellectually suspect. So, Jackie, a couple things. First of all, you know, I wrote an intellectual history of the paranormal once, and it's basic conclusion that all these categories were invented by academics and scientists the psychical, the paranormal, the supernormal, all of these words. And at places like Harvard and Cambridge and Duke, I mean, not, these were not minor institutions. So these were all, 
these were all academic words that then over the course of the 20th century is essentially get shamed and, and dismissed. What it will take is for, is for academics, humanists and, and, and scientists in particular, by the way, I, I don't really think humanists can't do much here because we, we already know nothing, right? We're already just- We're the bottom feeders. We're, we're the, you, you, yeah, talk, you were talking about religion, talk about being on the bottom. Um, so we don't, we can't do a lot here, but what the scientists need to do is step up and, and start talking about this and do it in a public way and do it in their journals. The, the scientists and engineers I looked at in the flip, what, what's kind of disturbing about all those stories is they virtually were all told after they retired, um, you know, those scientists weren't gonna risk their careers or their reputations. Um, and so they told these wild, wild stories, but after they were safely retired or had won their Nobel Prize or, or whatever it was, but they won that darn Nobel Prize partly because of that weird experience that happened. And, you know, so I think what it's gonna take is for actually scientists to step up to the plate. Mm -hmm. that, that's what I think it's gonna take. And I also, I also think in the humanities, I mean, this this new book of mine on the super humanities it's it's really a function of me sitting in a dean's office for three years and looking at the landscape and worrying about the future but also having hope about the future and and i think what it's going to take in the humanities is again for particularly people with tenure by the way to just get out of the closet you know i i think most intellectuals are in the closet on this one. Yeah. Well, you're not, Jackie. You're teaching it. You're you're out of the. Closet. I know, but I wouldn't do it if I didn't have tenure. Well, see, that's the point. So, but but a lot of academics do have tenure. So, what the heck are you doing? You know, get out of get out of the closet and start speaking up. Um, and I've told my colleagues this. I, I mean, they just I don't know what they think of me. They put up with me. Is all I'll say. <laughs> Well, I mean, I actually feel like super optimistic by the fact that you actually have an administrative position at a place like Rice. Like that, you know, that's that's a vote of credibility, which gives, yeah. gives all of us whack jobs some credibility, right? Totally. Like you pave the way. Well, like you use this phrase that I just keep thinking about. I think it was the ecstatic university. And that seems like to many people like an oxymoron. Um, yeah. And yet it is a place where possibly these things can come together and it is an expansive field. And I'm wondering if you could talk about the ecstatic university. Yeah, I mean, so one of the jokes I tell a lot to just prod people or poke people is that, you know, I've, I've figured out the criterion of all truth claims in the humanities. And then I ask them if they want to know what it was. And of course, they say they do. I don't know what they do. but I say, okay, well, here it is the truth must be depressing. And they always laugh. And the reason they laugh is because I'm right. Um, if you say something depressing, you're smart and you will be promoted in the academy. If you say something optimistic, much less ecstatic, you're, you're a new age dilettante. You're, you're, a, you're a fuzzy uh, thinker or something. So we have ways of, we have ways of disciplining one another. That's what I'm trying to say. And when I use a phrase like the ecstatic, I actually don't know if I use that, but I like that phrase. Um, the argument is simple. Look, most of our, mo a lot of these texts that we read to this day, they came out of ecstatic states. I mean, go read Plato for goodness sake and tell me that, you know, the allegory of the cave is not about a mystical experience, you know, or go read Friedrich Nietzsche and tell me he's just about you know, God is dead. It, it's just, it's just not true. You know, it's just not true. And all you have to do is read those texts and think with them. And you realize that a lot of these, a lot of our literature, uh, a lot of our theorizing is, is in fact ecstatic. Um, and you see this in Anzal Dua, you see this, you see this in Gauche, you see this in uh, Du Bois, you, you see this in James easily. I mean, James just tells you so. He just writes about it. Um, so I just, I just think we need to own that 
and, and stop pretending that we're arriving at our conclusions in some kind of cognitive computer fashion, which is nonsense. It's just nonsense. Well, I mean, I was, I was thinking about um, an interview in which I heard you talking about like, well, the quantum physicists can propose these things like Sorry. there's multiple simultaneous universes and there's <laughs> six dimensions of strings and they're doing this and it can be the wildest thing and we'll just take their word for it right. and believe it. But when somebody says, you know, like Hilma Afklint, I, I received this body of paintings from my non-physical guides where like the art historians just do not want to hear about it. Yeah. Um, so, but one of the things I wanted to follow up on with you about that is, I mean, so we have this parallel between mysticism and quantum physics, say, yeah. Yeah. Um, but, but also it was through references in the flip that um, I started looking into people like Bernardo Kostrup or Donald Hoffman, who just, you know, kind of says like, space time is doomed, people. <laughs> yeah. um, and so I'm wondering if you could, it, like, it does seem that like we have the quantum physicists over here, we have the non-dual tantric philosophies and kind of other models of mysticism and that, that somewhere in between are people like you and Kastrup or Rupert Spira having the capacity to, to hold it all together and maybe um, like th theorize non-local consciousness or these experiences in a, in a way that can kind of bring the two sides together. And I'm just wondering if you could talk a little bit about that. Yeah, yeah. So let, let's take the quantum physicists and mystical literature. You know, <sighs> We hear endlessly that, that somehow that idea was invented in 1975 or something in California, of course. And it's just not true again. The, the, the people who, who argued for parallels between mystical literature and quantum mechanics were the pioneers of quantum mechanics. People like Heisenberg and, and Bohr and, and, you know, the, 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 the Pauli, the sort of, the sort of, pioneering genius figures of physics, they, they turned immediately to mystical literature as the best metaphors and the best way to talk about what this was really about. So that, that just gets alighted. It's in the history of science. We just need to know our history of science better, I think. Um, I also, you know, I just finished, I was one of the judges for this international conference on the, the survival of bodily death, which is another thing you can't talk about in the academy, by the way. And one of the takeaways of reading through all these essays was that actually we have overwhelming evidence that some form of consciousness survives bodily death. You, you kind of have to work hard to think otherwise after you actually read, if you actually read the evidence and read the studies and read the reports. But what we don't have is a theory or worldview to make the data plausible. And that's what I see us doing. We're, we're working, working in the academic field, as it were, not to create more data. We already have too much data. We're working in the field to create a theory or, or worldview in which the data can be powerful and, and obvious and speak to people. And the example I always give is rocks, rocks don't fall from the sky, you know, and that's, that's what the European scientists said, that only idiot farmers in France or somewhere think that rocks fall from the sky. We, that can't happen. Come on. That violates every law of physics we know about. Well, it turns out rocks do fall from the sky and the, the, the silly farmers were absolutely right because they had just see, they had seen rocks fall from the sky. And but what we what this what the European scientists lacked was a model of outer space to make sense of meteorites. You know, once we knew about outer space, well, of course there are meteorites. That's not an issue at all. But it was never an issue for the farmers. You know, it was an issue for the elite scientists who who didn't have a proper theory or worldview. Um, of course, the farmers didn't either. By the way, I'm not. I'm not trying to idolize the farmers. I'm just saying what made 
that stick wasn't more evidence. It was a theory that made the evidence plausible. Um, I mean, I'm reminded of um, like in, in non-dual philosophies in Buddhism, they have this phrase, the view, um, and, and talking about like how imperative it is that we know what lens we are actually interpreting reality through. Um, and I'm wondering like, if you feel that, that, that kind of these, these conversations that are being had around um, consciousness as the primary material instead of physical matter or, or some of the adjacent theories, like, do you feel like that is starting to articulate some sort of view or are, is there, are there still missing pieces from your perspective? Well, no, no, it's definitely happening. I mean, in the philosophy of mind in particular, materialism is still kind of a reigning model, but it's becoming less plausible every year. And more and more philosophers of mind are basically abandoning it and adopting some form of mostly panpsychism at the moment. But they're, they're definitely moving to more of a, a panpsychic worldview, um, primarily because of failure, by the way. <laughs> Uh, I mean, and this, you know, this is kind of Don Hoffman's point. You, Don Hoffman is this, this neuroscientist of perception, and his argument is essentially, you know, we're going to, you, you try out a, a scientific theory until it doesn't work anymore, and then you abandon it. And for him, the, pretty much everything we perceive is, is, is in, in the matrix. It's an illusion, and, and we need to move beyond that. Not, not because of any religious belief, but because that's what the neuroscience and the evolutionary biology are telling us. Um, so I think the sciences are in some ways moving towards a more psych panpsychic worldview out of failure really. But I think that's part of science, that's, that's wonderful. Um, the non-dual stuff, the, the Buddhist and, and the, the Shaiva and the, the Hindu non-dual stuff, you know, that's a different culture that presumed that worldview, presumed very different things about mind and matter. They didn't need to be flipped. They were already flipped. That's not the worldview we live in, uh, in case you haven't noticed. Um, that's not where the U.S. university is. So we we have to work where we are and not where we wanna be. I, I would like to live in a non-dual, I, I, I think non-dualism is basically correct, but that is just not where my colleagues in the sciences and the social sciences and the humanities are. I'm wondering um, what you think would change socially, culturally, if, if this, worldview changed if our paradigm shifted and we have a we we had a different model well okay so let's go back to environmentalism uh and, and amitav ghosh i mean his amitav's argument is essentially that our climate crisis is really a function of this western materialist metaphysics and particularly capitalism and colonialism that sees the world as a set of dead resources that it can do anything with uh, to make more and more money and become wealthier and wealthier. And his argument is the only real fix to that is, is a new metaphysical worldview in which the world is alive and there are agents everywhere in the world. And you know, you can't you can't treat a mountain or a river or a land as a dead resource if you think it's, it's alive or has some kind of spiritual agency. I mean, that, that changes human behavior fairly quickly. Um, so I think, I think a lot of the things that are being imagined are kind of band-aids put on somebody having a heart attack. Um, I think you really have to go to the heart and, and see why that person is having a heart attack and, and fix that. Mm -hmm. I mean, maybe, um... Some questions came up when we were talking about your work with with my seminar around like in in the flip the scientists, as you said, um, like only talked about their experiences once everything was safeguarded. Um, but but also they were involuntary like it's not like they were mystics meditating in the cave 
yearning for this like incredible experience. And we were kind of wondering like, in your experience across cultures, across different kind of time scales, like are there things, psychedelics is one of them, um, like what are the things that are conducive to promoting the flip in the wider audience? Like we, we can't, like we probably don't, maybe I'm just impatient, but do we really have time to wait for all the enough scientists within the institution to have their flip oh, no. and then oh. retire? Oh. Uh, like, so, so what, like, what can, like, what are the other options here? Like, what are things that are, um, I mean, it may be, you know, I had David Yaden here from Johns Hopkins a few weeks ago, and he was like, within five years, psychedelics will be prescribed by your doctor and you'll go to CVS. Um, but, you know, I'm thinking of like psychedelics and the unexpected, um, out of body experience or near death experience that the scientists have as kind of the extremes in terms of how those openings are catalyzed. And I'm wondering if you have ideas about like what else? Well, so let me say something about the psychedelic stuff. You know, I've talked to a lot of those researchers including at Johns Hopkins and my concern about that is, is they're essentially medicalizing mysticism is what they're doing. And they're even talking, I mean, not them, but people in the psychedelic community are even talking about removing the experience from the psychedelic experience so that you could just get some kind of effect without the trip. Um, and what, what's essentially not really engaged or handled well with the psychedelic research is that people are encountering god or deities or spirits they're having really bizarre experiences of a living universe and those are just getting framed as therapeutic or as you know helpful in some there these people are not trained to think about mystical states they're, they're psychiatrists they're trained to look at they're trained to look for symptoms and to treat treat illness and mental pathology and well god bless them but that is not how you're going to understand a mystical state on psilocybin i'm sorry you're not going to um so i i'm skeptical actually um about the usefulness of that um i also know that the history of religions particularly in the west is really really bad it's 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 about monotheisms coming out of europe and crushing indigenous cultures that use psychoactive plants as the work of the devil and i'm talking about really really bad things happened uh whole cultures were wiped out peoples were killed those plants are part of a magical kind of polytheistic or animistic worldview that is anathema to a lot of the monotheistic beliefs of certainly Christianity, but also of, of Islam and Judaism. So I, I'm really worried about that. I, I think there could be potentially be a real back, a theological backlash. Um, so I don't know. I'm not, I'm actually not a wide eyed optimist, Jackie. I, I think there's a reason a lot of these traditions have been esoteric, frankly. They've, they've had to protect themselves from their own publics, which have been really nasty, frankly. Um, so, and I think that's still the case often. So we'll stay in the cave for a little longer. Well, well, I don't, I, I mean, who's we? I mean, I think we, you can always, you can always, do your own thing with your own with your own community right you don't have you don't have to stay. right right but i mean can i go to my provost and ask for a line in parapsychology no no yeah i mean i tried to find out if we had anybody in the science departments neuroscience or otherwise that was talking about non-local consciousness or idealism no not yet no no, no. i suspect you I suspect you could count on one hand the number of people doing philosophy in an idealist mode in the whole country, 
you know, uh, I, I'm, I'm not in philosophy, so I shouldn't say that, but I, that would be my guess. Maybe, maybe yeah. two hands, maybe two okay. hands. All right. Well, as I said to my students, like, don't go to your little shack in Santa Cruz when you're done. Like, we need you <laughs> inside the system working right. for this. Yeah. I'm still, I'm still here. I mean, yeah. Yeah. They haven't gotten rid of you. They promoted you to give you an administrative well, position, but that, I mean, that's, that's optimistic. Yeah. Yeah. And universities, um, I mean, I do have a lot of experience with the tenure system and the universities are not perfect, but they're probably our best shot uh, in this particular culture for truly, truly new thinking and truly, truly critical thinking, frankly. I don't see that happening anywhere else in the culture, um, but we're, it's by no means a perfect system as you know, we all know that. Yeah. Um, Okay, well, I'm seeing we have about half an hour left and I wanna make sure that we have lots of time for questions from the audience. Um, so if you are new to Zoom or newish, um, if you go down to the bottom of your toolbar, you'll see reactions and you have an option of raising your hand there. So if you have a question that you'd like to ask, um, in person's always more fun. Um, we can see your face and hear your voice if you're shy or still in your pajamas. Um, you can always drop it in the chat window um, and I'll try and keep track of that. Everybody's having dinner, Jackie. Oh man, you mean they're all eating off screen? Yeah, probably. All right. Well, I have a thousand more questions if no one's, oh, there it is, my sister to the re rescue. All right, so I've unmuted and will pin you for a moment to ask your question. Oh. I, so I would, yeah, thank you. I would like to revisit the question of what would make uh, Temple University here, <laughs> what would make universities more uh, friendly? Um, how can we make universities more friendly? You use the word conducive. What conditions? I'm still, that's still resonating with me, short of, you know, putting acid in, in the <laughs> water system. And, and I tend to agree with you about psychedelics having their place um so i would just like to ask that again and maybe uh, go a little I, deeper yeah. on that or, like for yeah. instance have you spoken with any colleagues that have i guess my hands are saying opened up a little more to considering yeah point of view? yeah yeah i have peggy i mean so i i don't I don't mean this in a cheesy way, but I, I love intellectuals. I, I feel great affection for intellectuals. And they, when I said they're mostly in the closet, I was being very honest. My sense is that, is that most academics actually know that these anomalous phenomena happen and they know they're important, but they don't wanna talk about them because they're afraid of sounding like the tabloids. So there's a, there's a kind of peer pressure that kicks in. And so I think the way to address this is for just more and more people to start talking about it and writing about it. And frankly, I think publishing, I think the university presses are really important here. Um, and I think the more they publish in these areas and the more, frankly, we hire in these areas, we need to hire young, you know, young faculty who are working in these areas, I think, you know, there will be a gradual change or shift. I think the academy changes very slowly, as you know. Um, I also think leadership's important. It's why I do administration. It's, it's not something I get up in the morning and say, gee, I want to do 100 more emails. <laughs> um, 
but it's very much about leadership. It's in about carving out a space that that people can ask these kinds of questions. So I don't have any, mm. I don't have any silver bullets there. I just, I think there are a lot of practical things that academics and students and 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 professors already do that we can just do more bluntly and. I don't know why we're afraid, Peggy. I, I don't quite understand it. Um, I mean, I do understand it. I mean, there's a lot of cultural pressures to not talk about such things. Right. But, Proud to be woo woo. Well, see, you know, yeah. And a word like woo woo, that's just a <laughs> exactly. rhetorical, it's just a rhetorical, it doesn't even mean, it's silly. It's just a rhetorical strategy like anecdotal or pseudoscience. They're just rhetorical strategies designed to hit people with. And I just, I don't know. I, I just think we have to stand up to it. And, mm. you know, like we've stood up to other things um, in the past. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Someone was about to ask a question. Oh, John, okay, go for it. Hey, this is a question for both of you guys, and thanks, thanks for this, this is great. Oh, hi, John. Um, hey, uh, do you uh, perceive a generational shift? I mean, it, seem, it seems like um, with, you know, the, the rolling crisis that we're in, a younger generation uh, is, is just thinking uh, differently, but through, through necessity, through pressures, and sometimes I think that can, um, make a shift of consciousness. And so I guess um, a generational shift in, do you perceive it within your context within the university with students, graduate students and so on? So Jackie, you want me to answer that? Um, well, so yeah. So the answer is yes, John. I mean, but again, I think it comes down to individual faculty. So. I pretty much any graduate student who comes to study with me wants to be professor of the paranormal. That's, that's literally what all they want to do. And I sit them down and I say, look, I know you want to be super, I know you are Superman, but I got to teach you how to be Clark Kent. Um, because you know what? Superman never gets a job. Never. Only, only Clark Kent gets a job. And so you you have to learn how to say things at the right context. And so what essentially what I try to get them to do is embed their interest in the strange or the uncanny or the anomalous in a project that the broader field can recognize as 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 legitimate. It's a compromise essentially, John. I wish I wish I didn't have to do that. I wish there were jobs for these young intellectuals. But as you know, as we all know, there are, are not, or there are very few. So I, I do detect a shift though. I think younger intellectuals who were not trained in kind of postmodern deconstruction and the kind of rigorous materialism of the academy, they're not where, they're not struggling with the things we struggle with, or at least I struggle with. They're, they're in a different place and they're, they're, they're ready to move into different questions and, and different, different, different things. Um, but I, I think our structures hold us back, John. I, I, I'm very, it's frustrating to me. And um, I don't know what to say other than to describe it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, I, I want to say like, go ahead, Jackie. you know, I, well, I like I didn't teach this class 10 years ago, so I can't tell you that there's a different level of interest. Um, but I know that that even from within my sort of very secure position in the academy that that I spent a long time um, veiling and concealing using language carefully in order to couch my own interests and tendencies for not just the, the academy, but also for the art world. And I think that what I'm still seeing, and I think it's changing though, is that artists at least are becoming, uh, I mean, you would think we would be the first territory that would let all this stuff in, but in actual fact, the art world is very much focused on 
real world issues, social and political work, um, emphasizing conceptual and research-based practices. And so for completely different reasons, there's just as hard a time to make these kinds of ideas acceptable. And I, what I see happening, for example, since the Helma F. Clint show is a kind of determination, at least on the part of some of us to try and find not so much the language of compromise, but ways of, of framing our work and our thinking that it is that it will kind of slide under the radar, you know, that we can um, we can kind of be the Trojan horse a little bit. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Okay. Um, I see Stephen with a hand raised. Uh, hi, everybody. Um, I think it's interesting that recently I put a Facebook post up sort of saying, you know, quantum physics, all the latest discoveries in science, it's pretty hard for the average person not to see that as I think you said magic. It's hard to know what, what's right, what's wrong, what's real. I guess the question that I have is, how do you decide who to fund? How do you decide what's real research, not real research? And I think it's hard in the, the materialistic fields I think it's probably even harder in your area. And I'm wondering how, how do you attack that? Yeah, that's I get that question a lot, Stephen. I it's a really good question. So the first so the first answer to that is a really practical one. I I trust a very small circle of friends and colleagues. And when they tell me to read something or to take something seriously, I do because I, I simply trust these people. I think it's the same way we we trust colleagues and we we trust you know we have a kind of professional circle we 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 work in um but you know a, a tougher answer to your question is i'm not sure the distinction's relevant um in, in other words i think fraud and fakery and trick is all bound up with truth and fact and, and what's actually the case. Um, I mean, I study religion. It's, it's hard to study religion for very long and not think that you kind of fake it till you make it. You know, there's, there's a kind of performative or ritual aspect to religion. There's a kind of placebo effect. Let me put it that way. Uh, a placebo is a fake, it's a trick but it actually works about a third of the time. So I think, I think it's tricky. And because I think most, a lot of paranormal experiences are functions of the religious imagination, I actually don't believe the literal framework that the believer believes. I think, I think the imagination is throwing something up there to translate that, that presence or that experience but it's not actually what's happening. And so I have my own hermeneutics of suspicion to put it you know, in, 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 in academic ways. And I think you have to have that to make sense of all the things that are thrown at you. If you take this near-death experience seriously, you have to take this one seriously and that one seriously, but they're all different. So how do you how do you mediate between those differences and those similarities? Well, you have to develop some theory of the imagination and some theory of what's happening. So I think that's the kind of the tougher answer to your question is, I'm not, I'm not sure those things are really separable when we're looking at these, ex these extraordinary experiences. Um, so I don't, I don't know if that helps, but and that doesn't mean there aren't actual frauds and there's not disinformation. And, you know, those of us who work in these worlds know there are. There are, there are people out there intentionally spreading disinformation, intentionally censoring people, intentionally suppressing research. I mean, there's a lot of nasty stuff going on. Um, so I, I don't want to deny any of that, but I think there's something internal to the phenomena that is also dissimulating. Uh, is the way I would put it. It's there's something trickster-like about the phenomena themselves. Okay, Sandy and Raymond and also Anju are in line. 
So. Hi, can you hear me? Yeah. yeah. Okay, perfect. Um, hi, Professor. This was a great talk. Um, I'm actually in Houston and um, my background is in public health and I'm interested in getting a divinity degree. When you spoke about medicalizing um, style of and treatment, um, I was really interested in what you said. Could you expand on that a little bit more about medicalizing spiritual mystical experiences? Yeah, I mean, so first of all, there, you, you can, there's, I sat on a panel at Harvard called Medicalizing Mysticism. If you wanna watch an hour and a half of this, you can do that later. But I can give you the upshot. The research, the, the really good research, which is going on at places like NYU and Johns Hopkins is I think really valuable and good. But what they're really interested in is therapeutic ends. They're interested in making people feel better or, or addressing depression or addressing post-traumatic stress disorder, all of which are really important things. But that's actually not what a mystical experience is about. You know, a mystical experience is sometimes not therapeutic and actually not helpful at all. It's an encounter with reality or with, with God and it can shatter one's worldview and it might not at all heal or address your depression. So I just, I think the whole, the purpose of, I think psychoactive plants are psychoactive for reasons there's a kind of intentionality there. And I don't think it has much to do with therapeutic ends. I, I, I really think they're, they're, they're about opening, uh, opening the mind or consciousness up to other realms of reality. And those are never figured in to these research components. Um, so I don't know, does that, does that help? Yes, I think so. It's really interesting what you just said. I think maybe there are some things that, you know, medicine just can't provide that spiritual experiences do. Well, maybe sometimes, well, so take the near death experience. That's a, that's a category of, of modern mystical literature that, that was generated in the modern hospital and is probably a function of biomedical technology. You know, we can pull people back from the death process now in a way we couldn't do 60 years ago. And the more people we pull back from the death process, guess what? The more people come back with stories. And so we get this whole near death literature. People had near death experiences before 1950, of course, but they generally died. And we didn't hear, we didn't hear from them. Um, so I think there is this relationship between medicine and spirituality, but it's not this, it's not this simplistic spirituality makes you better, spirituality makes you healthy. Okay, sometimes, sometimes not. Um, so I, I guess that's my, my concern about it. You know, if you, if you study religion, one of the first things you learn is that the sacred is not the good. The sacred is 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 power. It's it's presence. It's 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 terrifying. It's attractive. It's awe inspiring. It's also awful. It it can kill you as easily as it can save you. That's that's religion. Not we're going to make everybody better and feel good. So I don't know, Sandy, if that helped. I don't. I I have I have reverence for the medical field and for psychiatry, by the way, I, I, I'm a firm believer in psychiatric medication, but I don't think a powerful psychoactive, I think it goes way beyond that. And I think it introduces elements that psychiatry or the medical profession is simply not trained to deal with. And I, I honestly, I wish they'd ask us, I really wish psychiatrists would reach out to humanists and historians and say, please help us. But you know what? They don't. Got you. I hear you. Thank you. Yeah. Um, Anju has had a question for a while, and then we'll go to Raymond and Eileen. Anju, are you still there? Oh. 
Okay, Raymond, do you want to go ahead? Hello, it's uh, Ramon, and um, I am I'm representing Europa University, and I think we aspire to be in a static university. Whether we actually <laughs> are doing that or not is is a question. Um, <laughs> I, I just quickly want to say I, I appreciated the connection. I didn't know about the connection between um, William James and Du Bois and just appreciated that kind of, yeah, making that connection. All right, so here's my question. So, so a lot of the like superhuman in, in, in a, on our kind of dominant paradigm is basically taken up by technology, right? And, and I think in the kind of materialist worldview, you know, you have like the transhumanist conversations and whatnot, but like basically the idea is that if there's going to be a superhuman or a next level of humanity or consciousness, that it's going to come from some type of completely artificial form of life or by tampering with biology. Mm -hmm. And so I wonder, and, and it even gets to the point where people talk about like ending death. And yeah. so I, I wonder like how those discourses of superhumanity or super something or transhumanism, how those match up with meet conflict with discourses of superhumanity that are yeah. about like capacities that peoples all over the world have claimed yeah. actually exist. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I have a very clear answer. First of all, Ramon, let me say, I so wish I lived in Boulder. I, I so wish I wasn't in Houston, but I was in, in the Rockies. Come visit us, come visit yeah. us. Oh, well, I've been to Naropa, I, I have visited you. you I, don't, I don't think you were there at that point, but um, I, I, know the, I know it well. Um, so superhumanism is the opposite of transhumanism. Um, Transhumanism is a materialist metaphysics that presumes that if you just get enough, if you get the computer chip small enough and sophisticated enough, it's going to become conscious. So it presumes that, that the, the substrate of, of mind or consciousness is something material. Okay? Superhumanism assumes the opposite. It assumes that mind is fundamental and, and the material world is an expression of it. So I, I think you couldn't get any more different. I think the whole AI, whole transhuman dream is a nightmare. And, and I think it's based on materialism, which is just wrong. It's just fundamentally wrong. I don't think the brain produces consciousness. I think consciousness produces the brain. I, I think the brain is a filter or a medium of consciousness as the body is. And so it's a flip to use the language, the Jackie, the book, super, superhumanism is the exact flip of transhumanism. Um, and so I think that's really important to point out. Um, and, you know, there are some, what I would call good forms of transhumanism too, but generally I don't like them because they're, they're materialist. Does that help Ramon? Yeah, it helps a lot. I, I wonder if I could ask a short follow-up question. Yeah, yeah. Can I just add a note, though, to your comment? Please. You hit on a whole section of this this new book. It's called The Superhumanities, but the subtitle is Historical Precedents, Moral Objections, New Realities. And what you hit on was the historical precedents. And my argument is essentially, look, the whole freaking history of religions around the globe is all about the superhuman. It's all about the whole thing. Buddhism, Islam, Hinduism, even Christianity is about one superhuman, right? So I'm not arguing that we should go back to those precedents, but I am arguing that most of human civilization has actually been about the superhuman, not the, just the human. We, we, we sort of sit in an anomaly uh, in, in the modern world where we've, we've, we've chopped that off. And I, I don't think we should do that. I think we should, we should really acknowledge both sides. So you had a follow up. I'm sorry, I got, a, I got it, off. It's all good, I'll leave it. And I, I appreciate your response. Yeah, okay.
Eileen, you had uh, a question, maybe our uh, last question. Yes, uh, I'm a management consultant and an artist and very interested in this field. And I was going to ask, where can we learn more? I now know to read your book and where else do we learn more? See, uh, I mean, this is where I always fall. I mean, so the book comes out in June and, and of course that's where I lay this whole thing out. I mean, it's laid out in other books, but people always ask me this and, and I always say, I'm an intellectual, I don't know how to do anything. <laughs> you know, I, 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 can, I, can, I can envision things and I can see what's wrong and I can see what would be right, but I'm just awful at like leading a, leading or creating something. And, and so I just, I don't know what to say to that. What, it, than, what about the Institute for Noetic Science? Well, yeah, I mean, they're great. I mean, the, that's in Petaluma. Um, there, are, there are places like IONS is what we call it. Um, there's Naropa that Ramon uh, invoked. Um, I mean, there's CIS in San Francisco. There's the Esalen Institute in Big Sur. There, there are these little pockets, but you know, to go back to Jackie's point, I think what we need to do is put it in the center of these elite institutions and, you know, push the horse into the, push, push the horse through the gates and then all the weird people jump out. It's too late, too late. <laughs> horses, horses in the, is in the, is in the castle. Um, I think that's what we need to do. And um, great idea. Yeah. Yeah. That's, that's kind of what I try. It's what I try to do every day, actually. Thank you. Yeah. Great. Is there any anyone just dying with one last question? Um, there's there's a question, Jeff, in the um, chat from Kamala. Yeah. Um, what um, what are your thoughts on the growing interest in the metaverse, virtual reality experiences influencing or distorting other realms of reality? Yeah, that's a great question, Kamala. Um, you know, the first thing I would say is that this idea that we live in some kind of virtual reality is about as ancient as it gets. I mean, this is, this is Plato again. And there are hundreds of mystical systems that basically say that this sensory world you assume to be real is in fact an illusion. And there's, there's a deeper reality behind what you see and behind what you think. So I think this, this kind of this obsession with computer generated um, games or metaverses is really a kind of ancient kind of mystical um, desire or intuition, but they don't have, as far as I can see, the knowledge to locate it historically. And so it gets, it gets too materialistic again, and it gets, you know, it just, it, it gets depressing and it, 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 it doesn't, doesn't have any transformative effect that I, certainly I can see. Um, I could be wrong, but my sense is, is that those metaverses they're thinking about are, are all digital and they're not really thinking about the metaverse we're in right now um, and how to get beyond that, how to get out of it, not to get into it, I guess is what I'm trying to say. This is where Don Hoffman is great, by the way. For those of you who don't know, Don Hoffman, he loves the matrix, by the way, that's his main metaphor, but he's a, he's a neuroscientist of perception and Basically, what he argues is that if evolutionary biology is correct, there is absolutely no way what we're seeing and thinking is what's there. What, what we actually, we, we eventually have virtual reality goggles on right now called eyes, nose, ear, and, and, and brain. And it's giving us a picture, a screen, but it's not actually giving us what's there. He says, because if you're, if you're a gamer, let's say you're a gamer, if you, if you are interacting with the actual software, the game, you will lose the game every single time. You will lose. 
What you want to become a master of is the game, the appearance. So we've evolved to manipulate this, this matrix, but it's actually not what's creating it. That's something entirely different. So that's a very different metaverse, Kamala, than I think um, the digital um, entrepreneurs are thinking about. You, you are the metaverse, you, you're, you're, you're producing it right now. Um, we have Ada with a question. Yes, good evening. Uh, thank you so much. I really enjoyed this lecture. I uh, appreciate it. Um, I guess this, all what you're talking about, the superhumanities, um, that belongs to a body of knowledge that, you know, for whatever reasons, they seems like it, uh, the powers that be want a bit hidden. <laughs> So I guess, you know, that's why it's, you know, anyway, what I wanted to ask you is, um, what are your thoughts over the past, like 50, 60 years? What direction do you think it's gone since like the 60s, 70s? Do you think as we've advanced in this area, it's become, you know, that that's my uh, question. And do you think we've gone forwards, backwards? That's my question. Yeah, I think there was a kind of explosion of interest in this in the 60s and 70s with the counterculture. And then there was a, a strong reaction from the religious right and from the culture kind of whacking it all down. And I think we're still in that moment of this whack down um, from, from, the, from the far right actually. Um, I, um, Again, I don't know. I don't know how to recreate that that countercultural explosion, uh, other than to say just the timing was right and the music was right and the psychedelic everything was there. Vietnam was happening. I mean, there were a lot of things. Ha Civil rights was happening. Early feminism was happening. Early early gay rights was happening. Everything was happening in the sixties, uh, and we're kind of living in the the echo of that, I think a lot of the academy, particularly feminist theory, uh, black critical theory, queer theory are all outgrowths of the 60s and 70s. And by the way, so is the study of comparative religion. The study of religion is very much a 1960s kind of thing. Naropa was probably, I think, founded in 74, 75. All of, all of these departments even the, some of these institutions were all formed in the, the afterglow of, of that, that countercultural explosion. And now we're, we're, we're in the echoes of that and we're, we're sort of in the backlash against it. Um, so I think that's how we look at it. That's how I would look at it in the big picture. Um, I think we're deeply indebted, at least intellectuals like myself, are very much children of the counterculture. Um, I didn't experience it, by the way. I was just a little boy. It scared the heck out of me as a little boy. Those hippies in cars with flowers all over them and the loud music, it scared, it scared me to death. But you know, I was six. So, you know, what, what do you expect? Um, but I I was trained in an era that was kind of coming out of that, that zone. And like the study of Buddhism, Jackie, to go back to your example, the study of uh, non-dualism, those people all had were on all were had were inspired at some point by psychedelics and by pilgrimages to to India or or China, Japan. I mean, there was there was a real moment there when I think this really was 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 deeply influential. And by the way, those cultures. Those Asian cultures also had a conservative backlash. They also hit hard against this, this, this interest in their, their, their tantric uh, countercultures and their more ecstatic uh, uh, visionary dimensions. Thank you. So, so now we're ready for another round. <laughs> So we, uh, we all need uh, the Trojan horse building workshops, yeah. all the electives in every department, and, yeah. then we'll, and then we'll coordinate. Yeah, we all need to be secret spies. Yeah. 
<laughs> we are <laughs> like like Emanuel Swedenborg. <laughs> well, I didn't I didn't know about him being a spy. He was a spy. Um, he was a spy. Yeah. Oh, makes him even more well rounded. Yeah. <laughs> So, well, this has been so awesome, Jeff, and I'm hoping that maybe we'll have ongoing conversations like this. Oh, yeah. Um, do you have any parting thoughts or um, propaganda you want to? No, no, share? just go go out and do something. Just don't don't behave. Go do something. That's that's all I can say. Help, help. We need help. Great. Okay. So we're counting on you all. So we'll see you. We'll see you on the other side of the wall. Do we have a secret signal yet? I don't no, know. No, we don't. All right. We'll recognize each other. All right. This is fun. <laughs> <laughs> thank okay. you for having me. Thank you for having me, Jackie. And John, thanks for coming. I don't know if he left already. And I saw David and I saw Hussein. I saw a number of people I, I know. Um, so thank you. Thank you for having me. And uh, I know we're all looking forward to um, the new books coming out and uh, more nights where I literally like, oh my God, it's past midnight and I have to look up what the hell cosmopsychism is. <laughs> um, so yeah. Thank you, Jeff. And all for right. for everyone else in the group, um, um, after registration, the Paideia Foundation will be sharing with you um, when the video is uploaded to their site if you want to follow up on anything. Great. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Thanks, Bye.